a little over a month ago, about a month ago, a little over now, Corey and Austin celebrated their first year of marriage. That's Yay! Yeah, <laughs> a real accomplishment. Corey did a video, Corey and Austin together did one, so we'll link to that so you can kind of go see what their thoughts are about that first year. It's been really good, hasn't it? Oh yeah, it's been a great year. It's went by really fast. Super fast. Mm -hmm. Seems almost impossible that it's been a year. I know, it's hard to believe. And if you missed all the wedding hoopla, we'll link to that too so you can see the wedding. It was a beautiful wedding. It turned out different than what we thought, what me and Corey had in our mind, uh, and maybe what even what Austin and his family did, but it just turned out really nice and really beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. We had great friends that let us use their big, beautiful house, so it just turned out to be a magical day. But I think it's been a magical year. Yeah. Yeah. It's been yeah. very nice, very happy newlyweds. Yeah, for sure. So after Corey did that video, and with Austin recently about their anniversary, Several people asked me and Matt, kind of online and in our community, you know, said, well, what about y'all? What does it feel like now to have a married daughter for a year? So it's interesting to kind of dwell on that for a minute and think about it. It's been different, but it's been really good, really nice. We love Austin. Corey and Austin met in t what year? 2018. 2018. So we had ample opportunity to get to know Austin. and. Even from the very beginning, we really loved him. I uh, loved that he was his responsibility, his work ethic, his kindness. Of course, how he treats Corey like a queen. We loved that. Loved his family. He come from a good family. He had so many of the same interests that we did. Really, if we could have, if me and Matt had said, you know, if it was our choice, of course it's not, but if we had punched in what we, it sound like Granny Donna punched in. Punched into the internet. <laughs> She'll say punch in. If we had punched in what we wanted Austin or a husband to be like for Corey, it would have been Austin. So you did good. <laughs> yeah, you did good. I'm of course, we him. didn't have anything to do with it, me and Matt didn't, other than Matt giving Austin his blessing to um, ask Corey to marry him. But but she did good. He was He's really great. And so we loved him and had, like I said, ample opportunity to really get to know him really well and appreciate him. And kind of leading up to the wedding, though, it was so busy trying to figure out, you know, Logistics. we were just overwhelmed. If it hadn't been from Donna, our, for Donna, our wonderful friend who let Corey and Austin get married at her house, her and Michael both, if it hadn't been for them, we'd have never pulled anything off. She just had so much experience at doing things like that and so many suggestions and really took the pressure off of us, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Or didn't it? Yeah. But it was so busy, we didn't really have time to to really let it set in and think about it. Every, once or twice, me and Corey would kind of look at each other and cry a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> but but me and yeah. Matt didn't really talk about it much. We were just too busy. And of course, he's busy with work. I was busy with work. But once Corey was gone, then it kind of set, uh, set in, you know. And of course, all parents, as we, you know, as you raise your kids, you know they're gonna go out into the world, they're gonna probably marry and move out onto their own, have children, all those kind of things. No children yet, no children. Everybody keeps asking me about if there's children, no children yeah, yet. Yeah, let's, let's be clear about that. I appreciate it a lot, <laughs> but I get comments, when's the baby due? And I'm like, I would love to know because there is no baby yet. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, maybe someday. Maybe someday, but, right, uh, but not yet. I'll keep you posted on that. Yeah, but uh, even though you know that there is a, a sadness, all the way, although the definitely the happiness of Austin and being happy for, you know, what we could see the love and the future that they're going to have outweighed any sadness. But I'd I'd be lying if I wasn't a little sad, you know, knowing that Corey wasn't going to come back here to live. In Appalachia, it's really a family-centered culture. I mean, very, you know, it just makes yeah. up the whole culture is really based on that familial right. uh, sense that people have who live here. And our family has been so tight-knit since Corey and Katie was little girls. Uh, I remember Granny used to tell me when they were just toddlers, maybe a little older than toddlers, she'd tell me, she would keep them for me if I had to go to town or something like that. And she told me, said, those girls love you and Matt more than any kids I've ever seen love their parents. They're just crazy about you. Uh, and we were crazy about them, and we enjoy, we enjoy each other's company. We like to spend time to each other, with each other, have a lot of fun. Uh, people sometimes ask us if we're always happy and always get along. No, <laughs> we're, we are certainly fuss and argue and 
quarrel about different things over the years for sure but at the end of the day we just really love to spend time together and, and that's just our favorite people to be with is each other oh yeah so that played into you know there of course there'd be a little bit of sadness i said for all those years i had corey you know either across the hallway from me and matt as far as bedrooms go or down the hallway when her and katie decided they needed their own room and you know it was strange not having her with me 24 hours a day and thankfully she didn't move but 15 minutes away and she works for me two days a week her and Austin eat supper with us every week, sometimes more than once a week. So, and he's he's here a lot too. Him and Matt have many interests, you know, same interests, hunting and yeah. fishing and all that. So, um, certainly I feel sorry for or understand the angst of people that their kids get married and move far away. I'm so glad I didn't have to do that. Of course, I would have been happy for Austin and Corey if that's what they decided to do. But I'm secretly really, me and Matt both, really pleased that they stayed in our area and Austin was able to find a really good job and, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm glad, glad yeah. for that. I would have wanted to be closer than 15 minutes, but that house was just what we had at the time. Yeah, Corey can get that for me. Yes. We had something blow off before it blows on down the driveway. We don't want that to happen. There we go. Put a rock on it that time so it can't blow off. But yeah, me and Corey would rather, we'd like to be even closer. Yeah, I'd be neighbors. Yeah. And a lot of people would say, oh, you know, you get real sick of being next to your parents or you wouldn't like that. And I hear a lot of people say that. And, you know, it makes me sad, but I can genuinely say I'm really not like that. I mean, I, we're so close, I would be great with being neighbors. And I would be great with being neighbors with Austin's mm -hmm. parents. And I know a lot of people might be like, oh, you wouldn't like to live next to your in-laws. But I'm all about family. I mean, the closer, the better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I'm happy where we live now. But if someday there was a possibility to be closer, I mean, I'd be happy with that, too. Mm -hmm. And Austin comes from a really tight-knit family, too, the same as ours, uh, which is wonderful. He has a wonderful family. And I think that him and Corey both, that helps, that they both understand that, that how, how important family, uh, family is to them. So uh, Corey was saying, you know, she wouldn't mind if she was even closer. And then also saying that people had told her, you know, not to, that that wouldn't be a good, good ideal for you to live near your parents or your in-laws or whatever. I remember when me and Matt were first married and we were going to, Pap gave us the land. We lived with Pap and Granny uh, when we were first married and then Pap gave us an acre of land and he offered to help Matt build a house. You know, Matt didn't know how to build a house at that time. And he learned a lot from Pap and they went on to build many houses. But at that time, they, you know, that was it. So that's the only way we could have had a home. We both worked, but we just didn't make that much money and we just couldn't afford, you know, to go out and buy a brand new house or, uh, you know, a piece of land and a house built by the whole deal. So I'm so thankful for uh, Granny and Pap for doing what they did for us. But people would tell me that too where I worked. They would say, I don't know if I would do that or not. Are you sure? You sure you're going to be happy living by them? And I thought, well, yes, I am sure. And I can't do anything about it anyway because it's kind of my only option. You know, but I did kind of think, are they, what? Should I think about this? Should I? But it was only after I had Corey and Katie that I really quickly realized, who else in the world would I want to live by? I mean, the people that I love the most are strangers. You know, who else would I want to live by? Somebody I could call at any time, day or night, to come help me with a, a sick girl or, you know, borrow a cup of sugar or whatever it was. So that's when I realized, oh my goodness, yeah, what was I even doubting for one split second? You know, I'm, I'm exactly where I should be. And that, again, ties back into the, the whole family centeredness of Appalachia. Yeah, and that's a huge part, just the peace of knowing that you've got someone right there that you could, for us, living that close to Pap and Granny, I mean, I could throw a rock practically standing in the driveway and hit their house. If you were a good aim. If I was a good aim. <laughs> yeah. And knowing that you have that support right there just gives you such a peace of mind that you don't even really realize that you have until you have to use it, or maybe until it's not there. Yeah, so many instances over the years of them helping us or us helping them. And my brothers, they live here yeah. too, you know, so the same us helping them or them helping us. Or um, just the other day we borrowed, had to borrow um, weed eater gas from Steve. So, uh, you know, it's just so wonderful to have to be, be near people like that, to have that kind of 
um, family values or fam tight-knit family. And I know everyone doesn't have it, and I'm so sorry for the people that don't. My wish would be that everyone in the world had it. Everyone could be blessed with a with a good family and those tight family bonds. But I understand there's people that that it, of no fault of their own, it just didn't you know didn't work out for them. Loyal Jones wrote one of my favorite books about as far as Appalachian culture, more talking about like the, I guess, personality traits, if you will, or attributes of Appalachian people. The name of it is Appalachian Values, actually. And it's just a beautifully well done book. It's got amazing photos in it. They're just lovely. And, but then it's got just, when I read it years ago, the first time I read it, I was like, he got it, that's it. That's exactly how I see Appalachian culture. That's exactly how I see the people. I'll put the link in the description below in case you would like to check it out. But through that book, he talks about, like I said, different, and it's, it's like an easy read kind of book. It's not very long. It's mostly the photos, but then it's got text along with it. But he talks about, certainly about the family, about how important the family is. Talks about one of the, there's lots of different things, but some things that come to mind is neighborliness and hospitality. And also the great sense of place that a lot of people in Appalachia feel. I've mentioned that in some of my videos before. And all of those directly, like those other kind of attributes, directly play into the family, that family-centeredness. So when I think about the sense of place, you know, of course there's the towering mountains and the deep dark hollers, the uh, creek that we love, the rivers, the all those kind of things. The This is spring of the year, you really notice, like where Corey and I are sitting, there's some birds, the trees are varying shades of green, some leafed out, some not leafed out. You really notice it. So there's all that that really makes you feel like you're part of the actual part of the landscape somehow but it's that family centeredness you know how could you move off we say off I've all I, I like that because it's like it don't even matter where it's at it's just off it's not here it's not our immediate area you know but how would you move off and leave your family so there are people that do of course everyone doesn't stay some of those people maybe they're happy to be gone but many of them they move off and they spend their life working to come back. Maybe they retire. They don't get to come back till they retire. A lot of people move off and they find out they just can't do it. They just got to go home. So I know some people personally that done that, that uh, some people in, in Granny's family, some went up north to work in the car factories and, and stayed and made their living and their life was there. And, you know, they just come back to visit. But others tried it and was like, I just, I can't do that. I got to go back to the mountains. Granny herself, uh, she stayed with her, which is not really as far as up north, thinking of Detroit, but she went to Gastonia and Ohio and she she missed her home and her sense of place till she realized I better I bet these people so she says the people in Gastonia really like me I better go home if I'm ever going to go home or I'm going to end up out here you know so that family centeredness plays directly into that into that sense of place another thing that he talks about in the book the neighborliness and hospitality um, I have a video about hospitality. I'll link to it where I talk more about it. But just that willingness to help people. Well, if you're willing to help people, the most people you're willing to help is your, your family, you know. At Corey and Austin go back to them getting married once they started out. I, me and Matt really wanted to help them any way we could. His parents really wanted to help any way we could. So the uh, between the four of us, we helped with lots of different oh, various time. things, helping them get started, you know. And a it was time. just a pleasure. You know, it's still just a pleasure. And I remember Granny doing the same for me and Matt, you know. She still does. I bought this for you. I got this for you. I made an extra uh, cake of this for you and Matt and for your family. So that, that really plays into it. And Granny was telling me a really sweet story this week, me and Paul. She's telling me that... And we were talking about nothing about this, but she just happened to think of it and told us we were talking about churches. And she told us that when I, her and Pap, when they were first married and they were going to, I don't remember, I think she said they had, they had Steve for sure. And I think they had me, but maybe she was pregnant with Paul. And so she hadn't had him yet. But we didn't live here in Wilson Holler. We lived just down the road a ways in Martins Creek. And we called the rental place Sherlock's. We still say Sherlock's because that's who owned it at that time. I'm sure someone else owns it now. Anyway, but at that time they were going to a little church and that church decided they were going to build on. It's a really, really small church. And they were going to build some Sunday school rooms because the church was growing. 
and she said, your daddy give them his whole paycheck, his whole paycheck. He'd give it all to them. And she said, and I never said nothing, but I was thinking, Jerry, how am I going to buy groceries? Do you know we don't have no groceries, you know? But she said, we'd no sooner got home than his mother and father, Papa and Mama, they come and they had been um, somewhere at a church. He was a pastor, Papa Wade was, and they had had a pounding for them. So a pounding is a, a thing they used to do. Think of a housewarming or something like that to help you out. But you bring a pound of the, you know, maybe a pound of coffee, a pound of bacon, a pound of flour, a pound of cornmeal, whatever, and just bless the person. So they had done that for Papa and Mama, and they had come by the, to see, you know, Granny and Pat and check on them, and then they shared that with them. They shared that pounding with them. So then Granny didn't have to worry about the groceries. So it's a really sweet story, but then it, it again, it shows that those family connections and uh, how tight they are. And, you know, when we were talking about a, a moment ago about Corey and, you know, getting to be with us, and we're so glad, and, you know, she is here a lot and just 15 minutes away. When she was first, when they were first married, maybe that, you know, it's only been a year, but that first summer and then also especially in the deer season, last deer season, we had a lot of people ask us in the videos, like, why is Corey there? Is there trouble in paradise? Is the newlyweds fighting? And we were like, well, no, <laughs> how can you know, not, no. But it was in their mind, I don't know if they thought maybe Corey shouldn't be here or they didn't understand the, I guess the Appalachian uh, family centeredness that it's just normal that's just it that even if Corey didn't work for me she would probably be here oh, a lot yeah. in the same way I'm at Granny's a lot still and especially when I was first married I was there a lot with Corey and Katie even more so then but I'm still there a lot it's just kind of the way things are done well I mean and it's also like you're just gonna sit at home by yourself all the time yeah. or go be with family with people you enjoy right. and especially with Austin hunting I can stay at the house by myself I had before but I could stay there just by myself for a whole weekend, or I could come here. Or she here. come stay with us, the people she loves the most. Yeah, I mean, so yes. it's kind of like a no-brainer. But we know that things, cultures are different, areas yeah. and cultures are different. So while we were thinking, yeah, why, what? She should stay over there by herself instead of come and stay three days with us? You know, what? You know, but maybe they were thinking, well, that's not, um, I don't know, what would proper. you say, proper? She should stay by herself. But it, it's just kind of... I, it's just that's just totally a normal thing though in Appalachia when you think about it about people family spending time like that even after they're married and, and grown and gone and not unusual at all if a spouse is gone that the other you know the other one may go spend the weekend even three or four days with their family always reminds me of a, thinking about things like that and the hospitality and the family centeredness reminds me of a wonderful family here in our area the Chastine family and various different parts of them they've all been like family to us my whole life uh, good friends with Pat my generation good friends even Corey and Katie's generation now so just wonderful wonderful people but uh, some of them told me one time we were talking about things like this this is years ago and so maybe a brother and a sister you know but then they both got married and had their own families or whatever then they only lived a few miles apart, but they loved to spend time together. So a lot of times on the weekends, they'd go over to each other's house and they'd spend the night, even though they only lived a few miles down the road, even though there wasn't enough beds, you know, enough beds for everybody. The kids would sleep on pallets in the floor, or maybe they'd lay, you know, sideways in the bed, just because they love to be together. And why not? You know, why not? So I, I always love that, thinking about them. It reminds me, too, of all the hospitality sayings is, you know, when you'd be leaving somewhere, they'd say, you ought to just spend the night. You ought to just spend the night. Even, or come go home with me. Right, even today, Granny said, well, just come on in the house and stay a while. Yeah, yeah. All those, uh, my favorite. Uh, just makes you feel warm all over it. It does. It? What else is it, though, that she says and that we say, too? It's not come in and stay a while. It's... What is it? And we say it all the time. I can't believe it's slipping my memory. It's not don't run off, but it's it's something like no, that. Stay a while. No, yes, uh, yeah, like stick with us or yeah. something like that. Granny will say, you ought to just stay. We're right peaceable right now. We're yeah. right peaceable. Like, like any minute they may break out in a, in a ruckus. Yeah. <laughs> like she would ever do that. 
uh, but all those uh, kind of plays in, like I said, the hospitality that Loyal Jones is talking about. And of course, that's to people that are not your family too, but uh, definitely that family centeredness. That story about the Chastine reminds me, what is it, that Dwight Yoakam song that's like, reading, writing, route 23, where they go home <laughs> every weekend. They go home weekend. every weekend, load the kids up and go home every weekend. Yeah, that's a great song. Uh, again, the family centeredness, even in that song, talking about that they 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 were those people that had moved off for the jobs, and then they were coming home every weekend. Yeah, that you're willing to. When Austin's parents first got married, they moved to Ohio, and they were from South Carolina. And on a weekend, they would drive from Ohio back to South Carolina. It took nine hours, so they got back in time to like barely visit and sleep, and then have to drive back. That's an 18-hour trip. But that's how much they. But that's missed how much they family. missed home. Yeah. In Loyal Jones' books, he shares two different stories or kind of jokes that's really funny, but kind of showing as examples that uh, the sense of place and the, the family ties that kind of connect. Like I said, they kind of lead one to the other. But one of them is that a man died and he went to heaven and St. Peter was showing him around, you know, everywhere, explaining, giving him the grand tour, I guess, explaining what everything was. And he noticed these people that were chained up, you know, in heaven and he's like, goodness what's what's wrong with those people why would you chain them up you know this is heaven why would you you know why are they chained up and saint peter says oh that's the appalachians if we don't chain them up they'll go home every weekend <laughs> it's yeah. like yeah so funny. They'll go home every weekend oh, and yeah, because and that's austin's parents was certainly yeah. uh, proof of that another little joke he tells in it was um I don't remember the man's name, but maybe it was Uncle Harold or something, but two men talking, and one of them says, you know, so-and-so said Uncle Uncle Harold is a real uh, scoundrel, and I, I reckon it might be true. What do you think? And he said, yeah, it's true, but he's iron. Yeah. So in other words, yeah, he is a scoundrel, but, but he's, he's, ours. he's ours, so we're going we're gonna to claim him and take care of him. One other way, kind of thinking about Appalachian traits and uh, personalities, attributes, whatever you want to call them, that those family ties really play into another kind of characteristic is storytelling. If you've watched my videos any length of time, you've done figured out I've got a story about everything. And most of my stories are about my family. They're about Pap, they're about Granny, about my Granny Gazzy, my Mama Marie, my Papa Wade, you know, or the girls when they were little, me and Matt when we were little. Uh, there's a story for everything. Well, those stories, and it's kind of like a, would you agree, Corey, a lot of times stories, they just come from anywhere. If you if you ask somebody a question, you're going to get a story. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's true because that's people's way of communicating is to trade a story. Next time you're in conversation, just pay attention. If you tell a story, the, the person might respond to you a little bit, but then they're going to fire right back with a story. It's right. just your way yeah. of swapping stuff. Yeah, so know? those stories help you communicate, like yeah. you said, and con connect to each other. So when I share a story about Pap or, uh, you know, even about my Papa Wade, who Corey and Katie never knew, I'm keeping him alive, kind of honoring, honoring those memories, you know, and honoring what they meant to me, how I loved them so, honoring what they taught me, you know, they kind of made who I am. And, and I'm, but I'm, I'm keeping that going through our family. So now I don't doubt that Corey's probably shared some of my Papa Wade stories with Austin, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, it's like a form of uh, honoring them, but also keeping them alive. But in, in a, even though we're living in the future, I mean, you know, in the present and looking to the future, we're not living in the past. Those stories, especially the, you know, like the heartwarming one I just shared about Pap giving his whole paycheck, you know, giving, being so generous. Those are a roadmap to me still, but especially to my kids, to Corey yeah. and Katie and Austin, I claim him as a kid, but kind of a roadmap for them to follow, you know, like an example. And of course there's examples all around you in the world, but it's wonderful when, if you have a family centered culture like we do, that you can you can reach back backwards and also show those, say, well, this is how, you know, this is how Papa Wade did it, or this is how Papa did it. Um, very powerful in that, I think, very yeah, powerful. for sure. Another aspect of the family centeredness, what happens in places like here, like in Appalachia, where that is a real thing. I know this has happened to me over and over, and I know it's happened to Corey and Katie. You go somewhere, you know, maybe you're at a singing or something like that for us, and somebody asks you, say, well, where are you, are you from here? Are you from, you know, where are you from? We tell them we're from Brasstown. Almost always the next question is going to be, well, who's your people? Who do you belong to? It's like 
I've often joked that people in Appalachia have like this giant tree in their head, kind of like a family tree, you know, where they want to connect you. They want to figure out how you fit into this big picture, maybe more of a map even, but I, I think of it as a tree with all these, all these branches and leaves and stuff. And they want to figure out how you, how you fit in there. So for Corey and Katie and me, a lot of times we know that if we're meeting somebody, a local person that somehow we've just never not met, you can tell them I'm, I belong to Jerry Wilson. Uh, he's very well known in our area of Western North Carolina. So once you tell him that, I'm sure that's happened to you. They're like, tons, oh, tons I know, of times. I know. And, and maybe it's not that, you know, they couldn't connect to Jerry Wilson in their mind because they were part of his family, but they were part of his community. Maybe he delivered their oil. Maybe they used to love to hear him and Ray sing. Uh, maybe he, you know, they were a baseball player and he coached their team or the opposite team. Maybe he was, you know, a deacon at their, uh, or a Sunday school teacher. He was a Sunday school teacher for 40 years. Maybe they come through his Sunday school class, you know, so many different various things. Uh, but then they want to know that because then once they do, they're like, oh, I know you, even though they don't. <laughs> they know you because of that connection. Uh, those family connections are uh, amazing, but even when they, they bleed out into people that are not necessarily actually your blood kin, but it's that once they can place you in the fabric of, of who they know, uh, it's just a beautiful thing, beautiful. It's one of my favorite parts of Appalachian culture is that family-centeredness, the neighborliness, um, all those ways that we're connected together, like Corey said, to communicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a powerful thing. If somebody wants to connect to you, they want to. They want to know if they've never met us, but they met Daddy at some point, or they've never met me, but they've met my daughters. Then they can connect. You know, it's just a beautiful, yeah. beautiful thing. Sure. And I wish the whole world was like that. The small world, after all. Yeah, yeah. I wish everyone could experience those. Uh, real connections, that family centeredness, the neighborliness, uh, the sense of place, all those kind of things that Appalachia is really, it, it's really a beautiful place, ain't it? It sure is. Yeah. We love where we live. We love where we live. And we started this going to talk about, our, our main thing was going to be talking about <laughs> Corey and Austin and how me and Matt felt. And I think I hijacked it to talk about Appalachia. Is that that's, all right? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> it led to a really good conversation. Yeah. It's family's a beautiful thing, and I it wish is. that everyone could have a beautiful family. That mm -hmm. would be my wish for the world. We're blessed to have close family. Yeah, yeah. So sorry I hijacked the. I let you hijack any time. Yeah. I just like spending time with you. Yeah. So we thank you for visiting us and we with us, and we hope that you'll you keep dropping back by. Maybe you won't get tired of me talking about Appalachia, even when I hijack Corey's conversation. <laughs> I'm more of a listener. I like to yeah. sit and listen. Yeah. Love you. I love you. Now make me some supper. <laughs> I'm just praying. You want a hot dog? I think that's what I'm gonna have. Hot dogs. Hot dog. Hot dog. So nice out here. It's beautiful. This is like the perfect weather because it's not hot yet. But it's not cold. But it's not cold, but the hot weather's coming. And these birds have been circling because there's a nest yeah, right above, above the us. camera. There's a nest. And yeah. they can't get up there. So I know. We're disturbing their now. I feel bad. We better leave. Let them go back to their nest. Back to their home base. She's either got eggs or she's about to have she's eggs. She's about to, yeah, maybe. Little bird boys. Bird girls. Mm -hmm. <laughs>